Welcome to another episode of Eric Wade Whiskey Studies, and thank you for joining me in my study of the history of Scotch whiskey. In this episode, we're going to be studying the era of uh, the prohibition that took place here in the United States, uh, but had an effect worldwide, not just of uh, whiskey, but wine and beer and so forth. But of course, our particular focus is going to be on whiskey. This is one of the darkest times in the history of Scotch whiskey, but it's also one of the most important to understand historically uh, as to the causes or as to how it came into being, the effects of it, and then uh, how uh, we then had a boom afterwards. All right, while I am going over my notes, I'm going to be enjoying a glass of the Compass Box Extravaganza. This is the big brother of the Compass Box Spice Tree. Compass Box Spice Tree goes for about $70 if you can still get a bottle. Uh, this probably goes for about $120. This is probably my all-time favorite uh, blended scotch whiskey. Uh, absolutely superb. All right, let's get into the notes. Not long after the Royal Commission's report was published, all factions within the scotch whiskey industry found a cause to unite them with a liberal chancellor of the exchequer, David Lloyd George's People's Budget of April 1909. The provisions of this budget included an increase in distillers' license fees and in duty on spirits. This was a rise of approximately one-third, and all Scotch whiskey distillers were predictably furious. Lloyd George was a committed temperance campaigner who believed ardent spirits were much more damaging to health than wholesome beer. See, at first, the temperance movement comes across as sort of a moderate, hey, we're just concerned about people's health uh, and the negative effects of alcohol. So, oh, so we're just, uh, you know, against uh, distilled spirits. We're not against beer or wine. But once you allow um, someone else to control and, and play mommy or daddy for the entire country and they get that foot in the door, they're never going to be satisfied with just getting the foot in the door. They're going to want to come all the way in. So the temperance movement is a precursor to prohibition. Nothing could be further from the truth. White Horse Blender Peter Mackey provided the most memorable response to the budget when he declared that the whole framing of the budget is that of a fattest and a crank and not a statesman. But what can one expect of a Welsh country solicitor being placed without any commercial training as Chancellor of the Exchequer in charge of a country like this? And let's take a little whiff. Pronounced aromas of apple pie, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, loads of vanilla, cardamom, there's peach, there's some stone fruits, sort of like a sandalwood character to it. Mmm. Mm-mm-mm. My palate, the nose is confirmed. Intense and concentrated flavors. Real long fill, uh, finish. Real nice development. It's a mouthful of apple pie peach cobbler with loads of cinnamon, nutmeg, cardamom, and vanilla. Really, really, really nice. The higher level of taxation led to a dramatic decline in consumption of spirits down from more than 32 million gallons in 1909 to less than 21.5 million gallons the following year, and a number of distillers went out of business or ceased production for a time. Worse was to come, however, with the commencement of the First World War in August 1914, and the subsequent diversion of supplies of grain from distilling to the production of explosives and the brewing of beer. The influence of the anti-drink temperance movement, as well as military necessity, was almost certainly also at work. Understandably, the government and employers were concerned that overindulgence under the, the pressure of wartime might damage productivity. In March 1915, James Buchanan and Company and John DeWar and Sons merged after several years of courtship with Scotland's two largest blenders, which had also included 
the third of the big three, John, Walkers, and Sons. The same year saw the introduction of another measure that was to prove significant for the future of the industry, namely the Immature Spirits Act, which stipulated a compulsory minimum two-year maturation period for Scotch whiskey prior to sale in the belief that the mature spirit was less ardent than new make. The industry agreed to this compromise so as to avoid a further damaging increase in duty. The following year, this was increased to three years, which remains today in the United Kingdom. The act had the unintentional effect of improving the quality and therefore the image of Scotch whiskey among drinkers, as the average age of component blending whiskies rose. So as to defend their trade against further government interference, the distillers and blenders formed the Whiskey Association, later the Scotch Whiskey Association, in 1917. So we talk a lot about, you know, wanting 10 year, 12 year, 15, these more than a decade age statements, but the minimum age is actually three years. And apparently this change in the law actually increased the aging time for Scotch whiskeys. In other words, a hundred years ago, people were drinking much younger whiskeys. The temperance movement already alluded to was by no means confined to the United Kingdom, and it precipitated the next major crisis for Scotch whiskey, namely Prohibition. Now, the term Prohibition is first recorded in the USA during 1851, in which year the state of Maine formally went dry. By 1855, a further 12 states had followed the example of Maine, and from 17th of January, 1920, the entire nation embraced prohibition, courtesy of the 18th Amendment. If the state of Maine was dry and the entire country embraced prohibition, then why were so many people drinking alcohol? Why was there, as we're going to see, an increase in illicit distillers and speakeasies? Uh, the only thing that really embraced prohibition, the only thing that went dry, uh, was uh, the laws of the state. And I can guarantee you, plenty of politicians were drinking alcoholic beverages. Initially, the U.S. public took to prohibition with patriotic fervor, but this mood was not to last. And illicit distillation of frequently questionable moonshine and the illegal importation of genuine Scotch whiskey were soon occurring on a grand scale. In 1921, some 96,000 illicit stills were located by the authorities, and by 1930, that figure increased to 282,000. In the city of New York alone, there were said to be between 30,000 and 100,000 illicit drinking establishments, colloquially known as speakeasies, and prohibition provided a great opportunity for criminals to make fortunes from manufacturing, smuggling, distributing, illegal alcohol, in much the same way as drug cartels today. Now, you can see how very easily we look at the parallels of what's going on today with the drug war uh, and what went on back then with prohibition of alcoholic beverages, um, some parallels, and it could very easily sort of take a shift here and just discuss today's issues, but I'm not gonna do that. We're gonna stick with history. Key among the figures to profit was crime boss Al Capone, and Prohibition has been blamed for strengthening the hold of organized crime on the USA. Now let us take a wee sip. Mm. During Prohibition, supplies of spirits were transported by ship from various locations, most notably the Bahamas, for illegal sale and consumption in America. While the ships lay at anchor, small boats operated by bootleggers would sail out to buy supplies of spirits. The stretch of coast between Atlantic City and Boston became known as Rum Row because of this trade. The term rum was often used during Prohibition to no denote any alcoholic drink. One man who regularly sailed between Nassau and Rum Row was Captain William McCoy, a mariner of Scots origin living in Florida who began running liquor in 1921 using a schooner named Arthusa. By this time, suppliers and distillers were often meeting 
the immense consumer demand with very poor quality liquor. And McCoy decided to make his reputation by supplying high quality products, chiefly Scotch whiskey. This strategy worked well to the considerable financial benefit of McCoy with the term the real McCoy entering the English language as a result of the reputation he acquired. In particular, McCoy ran large quantities of the popular blended whiskey Cuddy Sark from the respected London wine merchants Barry Brothers and Red. Cuddy Sark is light in color to appeal to American drinkers, but in fact contains high percentage of malts. As well as the alcohol industry, farmers and other businessmen were adversely affected financially by prohibition, and the government lost a great deal of tax revenue. Scottish farmers petitioned the government to impose tariffs on imported barley. The distillers responded by volunteering to use only Scotch barley wherever possible. When the so-called Great Depression hit in 1929, it became even more imperative that prohibition should end. And part of Franklin D. Roosevelt's presidential campaign for 1932 included the promise to appeal the legislation if elected. Roosevelt duly won the election, and on the 5th of December 1933, the 21st Amendment ended America's 13-year dry spell. Despite the Scotch whiskey industry's initial fears about prohibition, Scotch actually emerged from it with its reputation intact, if not enhanced, in the USA, where consumers had appreciated its quality when smuggled into the country. Pre-bottled to avoid the temptation for unscrupulous traders to tamper with it, prohibition indirectly led to the USA becoming the leading export market for Scotch whiskey. By contrast, prohibition only served to deepen the existing crisis affecting Irish whiskey, with the Dublin potstillers who dominated the trade having been hit hard by the verdict in the What is Whiskey case. The War of Independence, 1918, 19 to 1921, and the subsequent trade war with Britain also denied Irish whiskey access to England and empire markets. Unlike their British counterparts, they were denied access to markets in Canada and in the West Indies that formed the basis of the bootleggers trade. For the thrusting entrepreneurs of blended scotch, this was a heaven-sent opportunity to increase sales on an unprecedented scale and Irish whiskey never really recovered. Irish whiskey also stopped being produced in Scotland. Until the early years of the 20th century, Irish was far better known than Scotch whiskey in countries all over the world, including England and in the United States, more than 400 brands of Irish were on sale by the time of prohibition. Not only did Irish whiskey lose a major share of its markets overnight, but its reputation in America suffered from the actions of unscrupulous bootleggers who sold all kinds of inferior spirits under the name Irish whiskey. With the Irish distilling trade in such a weakened state, it was the Scottish distillers and blenders who capitalized upon the situation when prohibition was repealed. If the Scotch whiskey industry as a whole emerged from prohibition with its reputation more intact, one whiskey producing area which suffered badly was Campbellton. Spirit made in Old Scottish whiskey capital on the Kentire Peninsula gained a reputation for poor quality and inconsistency due to excessive demand from the United States during the period of Prohibition. It is, after all, the nearest landfall on the mainland of the United Kingdom to America. Although only three distilleries operate in Campbellton today, whiskey making has actually taken place on some 35 sites in the borough, with the first written reference to whiskey in relation to the area occurring in 1591. Historically, the remote land of Kintyre Peninsula enjoyed a reputation for illicit distillation, being blessed with abundant supplies of pure water, peat to dry the malted barley, and relatively easy access to supplies of barley that is grown on the peninsula's sheltered farmland. There was even a local source of coal in the shape of Drumalembo Mine, while the expanding industrial towns of the west of Scotland provided a ready market for Camelton whiskey just a short sea journey away. When the writer Alfred Bernard, who had been commissioned to undertake a tour of all distilleries in the country by Harper's Weekly Gazette, 
visited Kimbleton during 1885, he toured no fewer than 21 distilleries and proclaimed Kimbleton Whiskey City. When he had completed his tour, Harper's published his tome, The Whiskey Distilleries of the United Kingdom. He was later commissioned to write several booklets about distilleries and blending houses. Well, in reality, Kimbleton was already losing its status as a producer of fine, characterful whiskey well before the imposition of prohibition. To an extent, Kimbleton was a victim of its own success. Some of the less scrupulous distillers began to turn out inferior spirit, distilled too quickly with a bigger cut, resulting in contamination with undesirable congeners. Con congeners are flavor compounds, if you don't know what a congener is which was then filled into poor quality casks. This was done to satisfy the voracious appetite of blending companies and Camelton's distinctive peaty whiskies began to gain an undesirable reputation, even being referred to in some quarters as stinking fish. Further factors in Camelton's distilling demise included the closure of the Drum Lemble coal mine in 1923, which ended the whiskey maker's supply of comparatively cheap local fuel, along with a lack of rail links and the port's remoteness by road from major centers of population. Through the interwar years, with prohibition, an interwar global economic slump, and high UK taxation levels, all militating against the Scotch whiskey industry, the Distillers Company Limited, or DCL, headed by William Ross, General Manager and later Chairman pursued a policy of closing down surplus distilleries, which DCL was able to purchase in order to more closely match production to demand, ostensibly for the overall good of the industry. DCL also embraced a number of joint ventures to acquire the assets of smaller companies, with Buchanan DeWar, formed in 1950 by a merger between rivals John DeWar and Sons and James Buchanan and Company and John Walker and Sons. And from this developed Williamson's plan to broker a merger between the three companies. They had for some time acted in concert in the so-called whiskey ring to force down the price of fillings from the malt distillers. One advantage of such a merger would be the stabilization of prices and an end to the possibility of a price war at a time when the producers could ill afford such cost-cutting measures. Agreement on amalgamation of the Big Three was reached in January 1925. Distillery acquisitions continued to be closed down and overall output was reduced across the malt whiskey and distilling spectrum. In 1927, only 84 distilleries were licensed. In total, 50 distilleries had closed since 1921, when 134 were in operation and around 40 of those were never to reopen. 1933 saw the trade at its peacetime nadir, with only 15 active Scottish distilleries. Of these, 13 were grain distilleries, which produced 5.65 million gallons that year, while malt output fell to 285,000 gallons. Remarkably, production levels had not been so low since 1824. The end of prohibition in the USA and a growing thirst for Scotch whiskey in North America did, however, lead to some welcome inward investment in the Scotch whiskey industry. Home demand remained depressed by a high level of duty imposed during the war and never relaxed. In 1936, the Canadian distilling giant Harem Walker Gooderham and Wartz Limited acquired the Speyside distilleries of Glenbergie and Moultonduff on a new firm called Harem Walker Scotland Limited it was formed in 1937 with Ballantyne's Blended Scotch as its headline brand. That same year, the company decided to build its own Scottish grain distillery, innovatively using imported maize, that's corn to me and you, as a principal ingredient in the mash. Dumbarton Distillery was duly constructed beside the River Clyde during 1937-1938 on the site of the former Macmillan shipyard. Officially opened in September 1938, Dumbarton was vast in scale, then being the largest distillery ever built in Scotland. DCL resented this intrusion into its dominant position in the market for grain whiskey. Alrighty, I know we covered a lot of information there, but this is one of the most uh, important uh, time periods. 
It's one of the darkest time periods, but also one of the most important. And we're still seeing sort of a ripple effect today from this. And, and if we want to avoid another one of these, we need to understand what were the causes that led up to it in order to avoid similar uh, situation in our own day. Alrighty. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this lesson. I hope you have learned from this lesson. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Um, and if you haven't yet subscribed, I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe. And you're going to want to ring that bell to be notified uh, when I post a new video or when I go live. And if you want to see more content like this, then support this by sharing this with your friends uh, and other fellow whiskey lovers on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking channels. And until next time, cheers. Yes, whiskey has gluten in it, just like your vagina has sand. Whiskey.